Happy Monday morning to you. It's the Pat Donovan Show with Chris Kosak right here on your home for live streaming sports in Tampa Bay, TLSTV.com. And this is a day that is celebrated throughout the country. And it's celebrated on different days, of course, throughout the country. And when I say that, you know I'm not talking about President's Day. Where the hell is President's Day a holiday? I mean... My wife took the day off, so she didn't have it. Who does have, other than students, President's Day off? Uh, Post office? Uh, Yes. I've done that job. Banks? They have a miserable existence. (laughs) I'll tell you. Whenever I go into a post office, and I'm going to, you know, tell you to do the same, listen at home, be extremely nice to the guy behind the counter. Not because he might go crazy and shoot you, you know, the whole postal thing. Yeah. But no, more so because... It's a miserable job, and uh, I, I had a friend come in over the weekend, uh, actually a guy I went to broadcasting school with, and we were talking about that, and I just said, you know, so many of the people you deal with as a postal worker are either stupid or rude or that extremely dangerous combination of both. Yeah. And uh, you deal with a lot of that, but no, not, not uh, President's Day, not what we celebrate today. And again, different teams, different people celebrating it on different days. But pitchers and catchers report for spring training today for our Tampa Bay Rays, the team we really give a damn about. Yep. Um, But I remember this feeling, you know, living in the Northeast. And I I know it's that way, I'm sure, for much of the country. We don't have that down here because, uh, well, you know, it's cold this morning. It's 50. You know, it's a beautiful day outside. It's going to be. And, and it's a little cold for us. But I know living in the Northeast or different parts of the country, you start to see your teams heading down to spring training or over, you know, in the case of if they're going to Arizona. And, and you start to see some hope. You start to say, oh, man, we're right around the corner from opening day. We're right around the corner from the spring. We're right around the corner from not being uh, miserable. Because let's be honest, if you're from the Northeast or you're from any other part of the country where uh, you have an actual winter, it's not it's not very fun. No. Winter sucks. <laughs> you know, I know there's... Uh, I like it. You skiing people and you crazy Chicago people. <laughs> I'm sorry. Winter sucks. You know, I, I originally I never wanted to move to Florida. Now I love it here. And, you know, I, I used to be like, no way. And we were in, a, you know, a couple years before we moved down here was probably the worst winter we had of snow in Massachusetts, where I'm from. And I'll never forget, I was in the driveway, shoveling the driveway with my wife. And I just looked at her and I said, let's go. Let's go. <laughs> I'm done. Screw this. All right. I know there's a broadcasting school down in Tampa where they'll help me get an internship. Let's try that out. We'll go there, get some experience, and go back to a bigger market. And again, I've told that story a million times. Never going to leave now if I have the choice. But... I'll tell you what, if you're from the rest of the country, you start seeing spring training, you start seeing pitchers and catchers, and man, does it feel good. You can't wait for opening day when you're going to actually see some baseball. You don't really see much no. during spring training. They air almost nothing. Yeah, and they, don't, they certainly don't do the first couple of weeks when it's much larger roster sizes. They usually wait till it whittles down a little bit more, and you'll see people that have a chance of playing on opening day, some more position battles. Then you'll start seeing them televised more. But right now it's just knowing that they've reported and stuff and just looking forward to seeing your team get on the field. Yeah, it really is. And we're looking forward to seeing the Rays this year. Really as, as optimistic, I think, as this fan base has ever been. And it, rightfully so. Yeah, at least in terms of the offense. Our, our pitching has been there for the last five years, and we've known what we're going to get from them. They haven't really let us down. Uh, but I think this is the most optimistic fans have been about the offense in a real long time. Yeah, and they needed that offense to get them over the hump, and I think they have it this year. But I think when I look at this team, I'm as optimas- uh, optimistic. Yeah, <laughs> the hell, it'd Fantastic. Be nice if I use the real word. Optimistic <laughs> as I am about any Rays team moving into the season. The Certainly. pitching staff as well. Certainly. And it's funny, you know, you look back a handful of years ago, and we said, we've got this pitching staff nailed down for years. Oh, man, they're going to be so good. Scott Casimir, 
Matt Garza, and James Shields. This, this group's going to be so good for so long. And then all of a sudden, neither of those, you know, I remember. Just Troy, Shields. Yeah. I remember. Troy, and he's the guy at the time I probably liked the least. Yeah. And we'll talk about James Shields and uh, whether or not we think he can do what he did a year ago again this season. Certainly not easy to duplicate. Uh, but there's a reason why I don't think James Shields falls way back to where he was two years ago. But we'll talk about that later in the show. But, again, when you look at this pitching staff, I, I remember spring training a few years ago being down at Al Lang. This is when it was still at Al Lang. And I, I saw Troy Percival with a shirt on, and he was making a comparison. And it had the three old aces from Atlanta up on top, of course, uh, Steve Avery, Tom Glavin, Greg and, Maddox. and Greg Maddox, of course. And, all, and then it had a line, and underneath the line it said, Casimir Shields Garza. And he was saying, you know, this is and, – and, and we all believed it. I certainly thought so. I thought, here's the pitching staff going forward. This is going to be a great staff for a long time. All of a sudden, Casimir just absolutely falls apart. I still like Matt Garza quite a bit. Um, I, I, I'll root for him with the Cubs, certainly hope he does well. I always loved – uh, Matt Garza. I love talking to Matt Garza after games. I love the fire that he had. I love the way that he, you know, a lot of guys, a lot of guys when you talk to him after a game, if they lost, it's it's kind of pouty. Yeah. You know, it's kind of, well, you know, here's what I did wrong. And they're not, not a lot of emotion. Matt Garza was BS'd. I mean, this guy was absolutely furious when he lost a game. And you could see that fire in him. And I love that about Matt Garza. Um but you thought that would be the staff for a long time. Now, all of a sudden, it's a younger staff and a better staff. Yeah. And all of a sudden, we get this kid, Matt Moore, who may be the best of the bunch, coming in really as a rookie now. And we don't know that he'll start the season in the rotation. I hope he does. I think he will. I, I think he will as well. Uh, but we saw what they did with David Price. David Price came in late in the year, went to the bullpen, was dominant. And then they brought him back and put him, you know, they, they, yep. they put him in uh, at AAA for a little bit. So... Wouldn't be shocked if that happened. I do also, like you, expect to see him in that rotation. But when you look at that rotation, they really are seven deep. Yeah. And that's scary. Oh, absolutely. And when you were talking about how the, the three pitchers they had before that seemed to be our staff that we were going to move forward with and kind of be what we build the team around, it's really a credit, a credit to the – organizations scouting and development that when we traded away Casimir, when we traded, when we let Garza go away, it got a, a lot of the fan base was kind of questioning it a little bit because those were guys that we were told were going to be the future of the pitching staff, but it's just a Casimir was the timing. If you remember. Yes. Yes. But it's it just, a, it's a credit to the scouting and, and development to trade these guys away when their values high and bring in other people, know what they have waiting down on the farm. And I mean, you just can't say enough about the organization and how they handle their oh. pitching staff and how they handle everything. Unbelievable. I mean, and then I, I, I really hope that Matt Moore doesn't get sent down to start the season, but I think you might see it just when it comes to the numbers game. Yeah. When it comes to arbitration uh, and all that and all that nonsense. I mean, keep a guy in the minors for at least until June, and then that's one last year before he becomes arbitration eligible. So, I mean, there's a little bit of a numbers game. So with one it. more year. You see. Yes, yes. They did it with Evan Longoria. He did great coming out of spring training. They sent him down to the minors for just the first month and a half of the season, came back up, and it was one less – one more year to wait before he's arbitration eligible. So, but remember, it didn't end up mattering because they gave him a long-term deal yes. anyways, and they just gave Matt Moore one. So yeah, that oh, that's that's, that's that's a great point. Since they did just give him a long-term deal, I would actually be pretty pretty shocked if he started the season down in the minors. Yeah. I, I wouldn't be surprised if he maybe started off in the bullpen and kind of. I would. I, if he's here, he's a starter. I don't think they mess with him and put him in the bullpen. I, I, I wouldn't be completely surprised. I don't want to see it. I want to see him as a starter because I said it before last season. I said it three years ago when Neiman was just about to be a starter. I was telling all my friends, a lot of my buddies, I'm like, look out for Jeff Neiman. He's going to be great. He's been in the minors for a long time. One of our top draft picks, this is the year he's going to break out. And he ended up having 20 wins that year. Um, and I think Matt Moore, a lot. I said the same thing about Matt Moore going into last year. And he didn't end up showing up till later in the year. But... Uh, I, I, I feel like he could be like the, one of the aces of our staff. He's just that good. Yeah, but, he's been amazing. But I wouldn't be surprised if he starts off in the, in the bullpen just because of the fact, like you said, we have like seven starters right now. Yeah, and, I, I, just, I don't think they want to mess with him. I don't think you want to mess with a guy like that and put him in the bullpen, yeah. make him start coming out every other day or every few days, make him throw uh, differently than you have a starting pitcher throw. I think you know this guy's in your rotation at some point this year. I don't want to mess with him, put him in the bullpen, and making him go through that routine. It's such a different routine being in the bullpen than it is 
being a starting pitcher. I think it's a bad idea sticking that kid in the bullpen. I don't mind it with Wade Davis because I don't think he's good enough to be in this rotation. I don't mind it with Neiman even to an extent. I'd rather see Davis. He's the guy I think is the best fit if you're talking about putting one of those guys in the bullpen. I think Alex Cobb ends up uh, back in the minors for a little while, certainly uh, for the, you know, I, I, I think you hold on to six of them. Yeah. And I think it's Cobb going to the minors. And then if somebody gets hurt, you've got him in your back pocket. And then I think it's, is, is it Neiman or is it Wade Davis that they find a trading partner for? I think if they don't find a trading partner with, you know, if they don't, and, and that's the beautiful thing about the Rays and the way they operate and the way, you know, Andrew Friedman does business. If they don't get something that they think puts them over the top, if they, don't, if they can't get a guy who they think is going to make a massive difference, they just won't trade anybody. No. They'll stick Neiman in the rotation. I think they'll stick Davis in the bullpen. And I, and I think they roll like that until somebody needs pitching bad enough to give them something worthy of one of those guys. And I think they should get a boatload for any of them, really. Yeah. Well, you, you, you absolutely said it correctly when you said, like, they don't make a, you don't make a move just for the sake of making a move. When you have a surplus, you don't just trade it away just for whatever. you yeah. got to have the right deal come around. I'm glad that you mentioned Wade Davis because I was listening to some of the interviews coming out of FanFest this weekend, uh, which was held at Tropicana Field on Saturday, and Wade Davis was very adamant about he is not going to the bullpen. Really? Very, very adamant. Did not he, hear that. He said, I, I am a starter. Like, and he was ba- like borderline upset about it. That, but he's very adamant that he is not going to the bullpen. So I don't know if that's something. I think that's more so just what he is saying. I don't think anyone in the organization has promised him a position in the in the rotation. I can't imagine. I, I think the only people that are guaranteed positions in the rotation right now are James Shields and David Price. I think everybody else. I mean, you could make a case for uh, any. Jeremy Hellickson. Yeah, Hellickson as well. You're, you're rookie right. of the year. Yes, hey, yes, hey. yes. You're absolutely Hell, Hellickson's right. Hellickson's in there for sure. But no, you're 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 right, and I think I, I don't I don't I don't see any of those guys wanting like wanting to take a step down and go to the bullpen. I mean, Neiman just went to arbitration and got about two million dollars. Yeah. Wade Davis is still on his minor league contract, I believe, so he would be the likely one to go to the to the bullpen. But he's been very adamant about not wanting to do it. See, I'm surprised to hear that because he did it last year. He did it well. And he also did it without complaints. So I'm surprised to hear that about Davis. Um, I didn't hear the interview. Um, so that, that's an interesting factor. I think if they tell him to do it, you do it. Yeah. And you suck it up. And that's too bad it's your job. Um, but I, I'd rather know that he's more comfortable with it. You know, I look back to J.P. Howell. Um, not that that's a great comparison because he was never a great starting pitcher. Yeah. But remember, we thought he was going to be a pretty good starting pitcher. Yes, we did. Uh, and, and then he, he just didn't cut it. You know, he had some injuries and stuff. And he came back. And he went into the bullpen, and that was one of the first things I asked him was because a lot of guys don't want to do that. Yeah. A lot of guys, you know, I am a starting pitcher. A lot of guys feel that way, and I don't blame them. Um, it, it's a different routine like we just talked about. Uh, but, you know, I remember asking J.P. Howell about it, and he just he, he completely embraced it. And in the, in the beginning, uh, he was great. And hopefully he can get back to a portion of the J.P. Yes. Howell we saw a couple of years ago. But, again, looking at that rotation, I think, you know, like you said, it's definitely – it's definitely, regardless of uh, order, who cares what the order is, it's definitely Price, it's definitely Shields, it's definitely Jeremy Hellickson. And then what do you do with the, you know, with the back end? Because, again, you've got three guys, four guys that you can fit into that four and five hole, and it's a, it's a great, great problem yeah. to have. And you look at this staff, you know, and there's a lot of teams that have had deep pitching staffs. Okay, where you go, hey, any one of these guys could start for most teams in the major leagues. I think the Rays have seven guys, seven guys that make at least 25 of the other starting rotations in baseball. Maybe, yeah. there's, maybe there's a handful of the Phillies, you know, maybe even the Yankees, Wade Davis doesn't get there with, you know, some of their additions and stuff. But at the end of the day, there's probably 25 teams in baseball that would love to have the back end yeah. of the Rays rotation. And when you say that, you look deeper to that. You look at James Shields, David Price, Jeremy Hellickson, and Matt Moore. Here are four guys that all have the potential to be an ace yes. for just about any team yes. in baseball. Four guys, just think, four guys that have the potential to be an ace on most other major league ball clubs. And they're all, and one of them is going to be the number four starter for the yeah. team. That's very, very scary, and that's where I think a lot of the optimism is, optimism is coming from, um, is that we've always, like I said, we've always known what we've had with the pitching staff, and regardless of if this one's stronger than any of them in years past, it's just 
that security that you have, knowing that even when your fourth or fifth starter is coming up, that they could shut it down and all your offense really needs to do is average about four, four runs a game. Yep. And, I mean, your pitching staff's ERA is going to have to be below that when you look at all these names on there. Um, but the, the one question mark that I'm still looking at is closer. I mean, it's, it's been a scramble for the last five years now. We've had – it's kind of just been a Band-Aid position. And I would really like to see if the Rays are going to – Farnsworth went healthy, though, was nails last year. He, he was, but if you look at his career as a whole, last year was the first time he was ever really a closer. And he's bounced around a lot, and he's had a lot of ups, a lot of downs, and you never know what you're going to exactly get from him on a year-to-year basis, on a night-to-night basis. Last year he did a great job sta- being consistent, but you never know what you're going to get from him, at least – his career has kind of shown us that. And I think if you're going to trade away one of the pitchers, I think the offense is fine. And if you bring in another guy offensively, you're just going to create another position battle. If you're going to trade away one of these starting pitchers, I think you should go after a top-tier closer. You know, it sounds good, and I like it. Unfortunately, the money that top-tier closers make uh, is not going to allow for that, in my opinion. You know, you look at the way the Rays build their roster. You look at the trades they make. They don't often make trades for that Band-Aid guy like you're talking about. You know, they're not going to bring in a guy for a year. They're not going to trade away a key guy. They like youth. We know they'll bring back youth. You know, a lot of people are saying for that other big bat. The only way that happens, in my opinion, is if that other big bat is an old guy and he's coming with a couple of prospects. I think this team knows they need to build with youth. I think they'll continue to build with youth. And because of the money that a big name closer gets, unless that guy's got a two, three-year contract tied to him, one that they can stomach, I, I don't know that they make that move. I love the idea of making that move. I don't know that it's realistic for this team and the way they operate to be able to pull that off. You know, it's very rare that you get to get, uh, you know, a guy who came in here like Soriano did a couple of years ago and just be the perfect fit at the perfect time for the perfect money. I don't think he's there right now, and I don't think they have enough money even to pay a, that, a guy that kind of money yeah. uh, if he were. So that's my issue with, you know, with that. I, I, I love the idea. Uh, uh, if you got a nails closer on this team, forget it. Yeah. Forget it. Yeah. It's, it's that good. I mean, you know, again, you look at so many times during the season when you look at the schedule and you're looking at your rotation, so many times you go, okay, in this series we've got one, two, three, we're nails. Or even if it's two, three, four, you know, if I've got two of my top three starters going into a series, I feel pretty damn good. Yeah. I think the Rays can go into a series with four, five, and one, and probably have the better pitching matchup every day. Yeah. Almost every time. Now, there's going to be some teams with some pitching, of course, and some teams that match up well with the Rays. But I think there isn't a team, there isn't a series that they're going to go into where you go, well, I don't like the way the pitching matchups go in this series. We've said that our whole lives as baseball fans. If you're a baseball fan, I don't care who your team is, you've always been able to look at the schedule and say, in that series, I'm not a real big fan of our pitching matchups. I don't know that we're going to ever say that this year. I don't that's think so amazing. either. Barring some kind of in, an injury, you're absolutely correct. But this is this is why I think the like we were talking about the top tier closer or just a, a very adequate closer will just completely put us over the top. Absolutely. Is that you have your starters go se- six innings, just six innings out of your starters, which with the starters we have, that's – not asking a lot out of them. Getting six quality innings out of your starting pitchers. Because, I mean, then you go to Farnsworth in the seventh, Rodney in the eighth, and then you have a top-tier closer for the ninth. So you're taking Farnsworth and you're putting him before Rodney now. I don't you're know. I, I don't know. Seventh inning I, don't, I, I think that spring training is really going to dictate that. And, yeah. I, and I think that they're kind of actually, if we don't bring in another guy, I think they're going to be battling for a closing position. And I think that well, might – Well, Rodney said that's why he came. I, I'm pretty sure I, – I, I was just about to say that. I wouldn't be surprised if the general manager and the front office – said that to him as they brought him in. Look, we've had issues with closers for a while now. Like, we haven't had a solid one just to carry through for multiple seasons. So we're giving you every opportunity. You can win this job right now. So, I mean, that's I've said that for the last few years. I don't understand why any – Big name in a bullpen wouldn't want to come here. Just considering it's the only any player. It's the only yeah. It's the only question mark we ever have year in and year out about the Rays is that bullpen. Joe Madden always makes it work. Him and Hickey always work that yeah. that bullpen perfectly. Last but, year, remember, we thought it was going to be bad. Yeah. You know that was the big question for most Rays fans, most Rays analysts, most people that looked at that team said that staff's going to be good. The offense somehow they always find a way to get it done. Although last year it was putrid for much of the year. Yes. Um, but the big question going into last year, remember, was that bullpen. 
and it and it didn't end up being a weakness at all. No, it, it really it really good. wasn't. It was it was the offense that kind of no. dragged us down a little bit from time to time. But every aspect of the pitching staff, from the rotation to the bullpen, was just great last year. But still, I think you need a little bit of insurance, like I said, because you never know what you're going to get season to season with Farnsworth. When we brought him in last year. I honestly didn't even think he was going to make it through the whole season. Like that's oh just, yeah, I'm with you. I didn't think he was going to be the closer at all. That's just how up and down he is over his career. I mean, he could come out and have a. Uh, spring training ERA in, in double digits. And like, it, it wouldn't surprise me because you never know what you're going to get from him. And it wouldn't concern you either. You know, know, it, it'd just be it, like, oh, it's Farnsworth for you. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I think it would probably cost him the, the closer's job. But, I mean, we've kind of had this bolt, this closer by committee for a while. And except I think, for with, you know, Soriano. With, yes, except for with Soriano and with Percival before that. But I think it would just – Even with Percival, though, he could never stay healthy long enough yeah, to it was, be that guy. Yeah, there was the one season where he stayed healthy basically the whole year when the Rays went to the World Series. Yeah. Uh, but then after that, it was just battling injuries, and I think a lot of that was just his age. Um, but either, either way, I think that we just need a little bit more – even if we don't bring in somebody else – we got to find somebody on the staff or somebody that's willing to take that demotion to the bullpen and not see it as a demotion. See it as another opportunity for success, another opportunity to show what you can do. And I, I really think Wade Davis would be perfect for that role, but he's made it clear he doesn't want to do it. And that's a, a, little bit, a little bit alarming, but, I mean, if Farnsworth and Rodney have good springs, I think that'll help put a lot of those, uh, a lot of those worries to ease. Yeah, and at the end of the day... That's why we have the best manager in baseball. And if he has to sit Wade Davis down and go, look, this is your opportunity to be on a championship team. We feel like we've got that team. Unfortunately, it doesn't involve you in the rotation right now as we're constituted. Then injury, too, you're the guy. But guess what? Right now, we just can't fit you in. And I think this is your opportunity to be part of a great team. Don't screw that up. Yeah. Don't screw that up. And, and I could see Joe Madden having that conversation with him. Maybe not those words, but certainly letting him know, look, this is your opportunity to be part of a great baseball team. You've been a part of some not-so-great ones. This is an opportunity to be part of a great one. I think that Joe Madden is the guy that can have that happen seamlessly, regardless of whether or not he's happy about it. I think he does it if they ask him to, and I think he does it without incident. I don't think he's the kind of guy that is going to create a big stink if it has to happen. He won't be happy, and that's probably why he's letting it know now. Hey, I'm the kind of guy that I'm not going to piss and moan. But let me, know, let me let you know beforehand, I look at myself as a starter. I believe I'm one of the best guys, and I want him to believe that because if he doesn't, he's probably not going to be that good anyway. So, you know what? You look at this team again, and if you look at the numbers over the last three seasons of the Rays' record when they've scored at least four runs, it's unbelievable. It's unbelievable. And if you go to five, it's even better. Yeah. This is an offense that can finally do that usually on a consistent basis. I don't think we're going to see the kind of droughts. I think we'll see some. Sure. I don't think we'll see. You always see some. Every baseball team sees some. And that's what's hard for baseball fans is, you know, every team goes through it once in a year, and then you learn who the real fans are because everyone else goes, oh, my God, we suck again. <laughs> and, you know, it's just it's, it's, it's laughable sometimes, the people that you, you see the fake baseball fans right away because the baseball season's so long, and as soon as you hit that bump that every team hits, those fraudulent fans start crawling out of the woodworks freaking out about everything but you finally got a team that should be able to put up those runs consistently paired with the best staff this team has ever had it's a reason why a lot of people believe this is a world series contender if not a world series favorite i'm a favorite right now to go to a break Me and Chris <laughs> the Sock. we'll be right back it's the pat donovan show Keeps the tackler, gets pushed out of bounds, but... Deep, and it's intercepted in the end zone by Robert Davis, and Nelson Aguilar will walk in again with another Berkeley prep touchdown.
open. And another ace to the same position. The tackler gets pushed out of bounds, but deep. And it's intercepted in the end zone by Robert Davis. And Nelson Aguilar will walk in again with another Berkeley prep touchdown. sometimes I never know if I'm doing anything right <laughs> Are you recording today I am recording I believe but the bugs not showing up and uh, I don't know this thing's weird sometimes it's all right so I was I was definitely and you know I hope people don't take this the wrong way when I say this but uh, I was definitely born to be talent was definitely born to be talent because they're not good at anything else. I don't take that the wrong way because I know exactly what you mean by that. Well, yeah, you work with me. Yeah. <laughs> you're, you're, always, you're always cleaning up my messes when I try to do anything else, you know? I can talk. I can talk.
But uh, when it comes down to these wires and the computer, and uh, I'm just like, you know, I've decided to wear a bunch of hats here because we're a small company and I got to do what I got to do. But uh, I'm not necessarily good at all of it. Let's just say that, you know, and it's great because everywhere we go, people see me sitting at the table with all the stuff and they come up and it's like, oh, does that have a uh, blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, I have no idea. <laughs> oh, are you using this complex, this, that? And I'm just like, dude, I don't know. I hit the button. It streams most of the time. Yeah, if it doesn't, and, you just kind of uh, put your hands up. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not any good at this stuff. I'm sorry. The stuff I'm good at, this is not it. So, yeah, you know what I mean. It's, it's, uh, so, yeah, hopefully it's, it's going. I think it's going. Well, good segue into, I guess you're saying, fitting like a square peg into a round hole like doesn't necessarily work all the time, but you try to make it work. Uh, you're losing me. All right, well, seg- seg- segue to the race. Where, what, like we were talking about with the bullpen. Like, if Wade Davis doesn't want to do it and he says it's not what he wants to do, he's not going to feel comfortable doing it. I mean, even like you said, I know Joe Madden's going to try to put it, he'll put it better than anybody can possibly put it to break to a player that he's not going to be doing what he would love to be doing or what he ideally would want to be doing. But if he's not going to be happy with it and it starts showing in his play, I think he, he might be quickly out. And I don't want to see it because I think he has a lot of promise. He's shown how good he could be in the starting rotation. But I think he could be great just as a 2-3 inning guy, kind of replacing what Sonnenstein was for the last couple of years. And that's what we need. And yeah. it won't take any real change. Great long guy. Yeah, it won't, it won't take any changes in spring training. You don't have to, like, if, you, if you're going to try to make a guy a starter to a closer, you have to say that right at the start of spring training and yeah. get his arm ready for those amount of innings and that type of strain on your arm as opposed to stretching him out and being a starter. How great is it that we won't see Jonathan Papelbon this year until oh, the World that's Series? Gonna be, oh, that's going to be great. You like no. how I threw that in there? Yeah. The, until the World Series? <laughs> well, I don't see the Phillies making the World Series this year, to be honest with you. I'll tell you what. Whenever you got that kind of pitching, like we, like we say about the Rays, it's hard to argue with. And I know they, they don't have uh, the, off, the They don't have the offense anymore. we have. How often have we been able to say that? I don't think they have the <laughs> offense that we have. Can I, you? I know Raul Ibanez, uh, New, York, New York Yankee now. Um, I still think Chase Utley has a better year if he can stay healthy. You know, this is a guy that was an MVP. This is yeah. a guy that's, uh, you know, who knows about Jimmy Rollins. He seems to have really fallen off the cliff. Yes, he has. Um, Howard, you know, you got to wonder about his health. He got hurt late last year, didn't he? Yeah. Uh, in the playoffs, correct? Yeah, I mean, yes. In, 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 yeah, very bro- end of the bro- NLCS, he broke his wrist, right? Yeah, broke was his wrist. Wrist or his foot? It was one of the two. I don't remember exactly what. I think it was Pujols that broke his wrist last year, and I think it was Howard that broke his foot stepping on first base during a play. Yeah, it was like the end too. It was yeah. like the last play the of last, the damn series. Last or something, play of the right? game. Yeah, I believe it was. Yeah. So you got to wonder how he comes off the injury, but still, they've got some guys that have been MVP candidates. Yes. And I think we've got a guy who will be, eventually. Obviously, Evan Longoria. Yes. I think it's pretty close offensively, and I think they both have two of the best pitching staffs in baseball, and I won't say the Phillies are going to win the National League. I won't be surprised if they do, though. Yeah, I mean, it's going to be a little bit harder for them to get a lot of regular season wins just when you look at, in their own division, what the Marlins Come on, have they done. all suck. With what the Marlins have done. The Marlins are going to suck. They will. and The I ho- Mets are going to suck again. The Marlins are going to suck, and I hope that they do, but... You can't argue that they've improved their team. Oh, yeah. And it's definitely going to equal more wins in the standings, and they could take a couple away from the Phillies. Certainly. Uh, I mean, they're going to be a little bit – they're going to be way more competitive. But is Um, there anybody you believe has a shot to win the East other than the Phillies? You like the Braves that much? The Braves looked really good last year. The Braves looked really good at times last year, and I think that Jason— Bobby Cox is not walking through that door. No, 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 he's not, and neither is the pitching staff that they used to have. But, I mean, you look got a top-tier guy like Jair Jurgens, and you got— a great hitter like Jason Hayward, I mean... Jaja Binks. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, Who they got... was on the, uh, by the way, the, the ride. Oh, he was? Uh, yeah. Oh, great. <laughs> that was the biggest disappointment of the whole thing. I was like, oh, God, I got to listen to Binks? Very yeah. quickly, but... Yeah, talking about Star Tours here. Yeah, sorry, folks. Uh, <laughs> Star Tours. Yeah, they could have left him <laughs> off... Of, they could have left him off of the roster on that one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I don't know. I, I, I don't believe in the Braves. I just, I look at the Braves... I see that every year they get on this streak where they're playing the best baseball of anybody in the world. At the end, I just don't believe in them. I really don't. Well, honestly, I think it's it's so hard to gauge teams in the National League just because, honestly, and, and 
the, the AL and NL is so different with how you pitch to guys. And I don't know. Oh, yeah. I don't understand what the difference is. I don't think it's all just that ninth spot being the pitcher in the lineup that makes all these differences. I mean, you'll see in the AL a 3-0 count, somebody throw a curveball or a slider. They won't just throw a get-me-over fastball because that gets mashed in the American League. You have a lot of free swingers that will swing 3-0. and So you got pitchers in the AL that try to mix things up, even with a 3-0 count, a 3-1 curveball, like, and you don't see that in the NL. In the NL, you see them just groove fastballs 3-0, and, I mean, I don't know, it's just a little bit different. Like, the whole style is just a lot different. And I think that there's more of an emphasis on pitching in the NL than there is offense. So if you have three good starters, I mean, I think any, anybody could w- really win. I mean, you've, you've seen it. Like last year, I mean, who, who saw the Giants winning the World Series two years ago? I did. I no. totally called that. Yeah, right. Yeah, I'm lying. <laughs> I, I didn't see that either. Um, I like Tim Lincecum quite a bit. Oh, so way, do I. For the record. So do I. What a goofy looking kid. But, I mean, he's just, I don't know. He seems like, a, he seems like he's all right. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, I'm just going to say this, dude. Sid Bream is not working, walking through that door. No. Sid Bream, without a doubt, the greatest Braves player of all time outside of Henry Aaron. You just can't say that about, you know, it, Hank Aaron is Hank Aaron. You yeah. can't, outside of Hank Aaron, Sid Bream, greatest Brave of all time. Yeah. <laughs> no? No, I mean, I, I wouldn't say so. But, I mean, just when you Sid look. Sid Bream! Bro. I know I know who Sid Bream is, but, <laughs> I mean, just the look. The play at the plate. Yeah, I mean, the play at the plate was unbelievable. Makes him the greatest Brave ever. No, nah, he, dude, Sid Bream is, is, uh, old Lakers, Kurt Rambis. You know what I mean? Yeah. This is that goofy guy that you like. If you met him in public, you'd go, you're not a pro athlete, yeah. dude. <laughs> you're not a, come on, come on. <laughs> you know, it's like we were talking about last week, baseball players, basketball players, football players. You get in an NBA locker room, and it's just scary. Yeah. You know, I talk about beat DJ Manga, not a great basketball player, but I turn around one day in the Lakers locker room and I'm, I almost crap myself. Just a massive guy. Baseball players, more so than any other sport, there are guys who look like they, you know, they are but as athletic as I am. <laughs> I mean, I really liked Troy Percival while he was here until he fell apart and it was difficult to see him on the field. Yeah. But as a guy, you know, he was one of those gruff guys, didn't mind telling you to screw if he didn't want to talk to you, but a good guy, you know what I mean? And, and great insight. I mean, this is a guy when I asked him questions, I just loved to listen to his answers. You know, I'll never forget early on as a rookie, seeing Evan Longoria make a play, and I just went, holy crap. And I said something to Percival, and I, I, I'm drawing a blank now. I wish I could. There's a third baseman that Percival played with, for a long time, it was one of the greats, and I don't know why I'm drawing a blank on it right now. But I said, seeing plays like that, does he does it remind you of playing with a guy like? And I, and I don't know why I can't think of his name, and it's killing me. Um, but he said, Evan Long, and this is his rookie year. Evan Longoria, Evan Longoria is the best defensive third baseman I've ever played with. Wow. Already, and I'm just like, wow. And it was things like that that you know you didn't always get from other guys. He had the experience in the league to be able to compare things yeah. to say, hey. This is a different team. This is a special team. You know, you saw it yourself, but when you get guys like Troy Percival confirming it, guys like Cliff Floyd confirming it, that have been there, that have seen that, who have been in those clubs. I've never been in a championship clubhouse, even as a reporter, let alone as a player. Yeah. So these guys had that kind of uh, knowledge and wisdom. That it just was great to talk to those kind of guys. And I just remember, you know, hearing that. But he's one of those guys that, you look at him, and, you know, if you saw him walking down the street, especially when he was here, towards the end of his career, you'd, you know, whose grandfather is that? Yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean, it just not. I mean, I mean, that's just Major League Baseball players for you. They're, not all of them. No. But there's, uh, there's a lot of them that are very average-looking dudes. Kevin Millar is another guy. Yeah. You stand and talk to Kevin Millar and think, this is a world-class athlete. That's across your <laughs> mind. It does in most of the other sports. In baseball, it's funny how that doesn't work. No, I mean, you're absolutely, like you even said about Tim Lincecum, does not look like an athlete by any stretch of the imagination. You look at somebody like on the... I'm convinced I could beat his ass. Yeah, I mean, you look at CC Sabathia. He I doesn't... don't want to, I like him. <laughs> CC Sabathia does not look like an athlete. Sabathia, I'm telling you, I've stood toe-to-toe with the guy. Sabathia is sneaky athletic. Really? Like I am. Okay. All right, you've played basketball yes, one-on-one with Gotten... the round mound of white rebound, right mound mound of rebound. <laughs> Yes. I'm sneaky athletic. I'm not an athlete by any means. I'm a slob compared to pro athletes or high school athletes. 
but I'm more athletic than you expect. And that's CeCe Sabathia. You can see it when you're next to the guy. You know, he's a big guy. He's a heavy guy. But those legs are solid. You know what I mean? This guy's a rock. He yeah. doesn't look like a rock, but he is. There's some of those guys that are heavy set. Cecil Fielder comes to mind. Not that yeah. I've ever been next to Cecil Fielder. But there was a guy that was heavy, but you could tell he was strong as an ox. Yeah. And that's CC Sabathia, I think, too. Yeah, I mean, Prince Fielder is a lot like that, too. Yeah. But you see Prince, like, how, how in the world, like, when you, look at, when you look at the guy and then you look at his stats and realize, I think he's had, like, three inside-the-park home runs in his career. That's Sad. nuts. That's absolutely nuts. But that just shows even, like, he doesn't pass the eye test, but he's a good athlete. Oh. He really is. I'll tell you what, I don't know that there's a father-son athlete combination that I like better than the fielders. Yeah. I loved, when I was a kid, and again, if you've never seen me, what the hell are you doing? For, <laughs> oh, if you've never seen me, um, athleticism is not the first thing that comes to mind. I am, I, I've been a fat kid my whole life. Now I'm a fat adult. Uh, but I've been fat my whole life. Never bothered me. You know, I worry about my health sometimes now because I'm getting old. But... Growing up, I didn't care. But I always had this kind of – I always rooted for the big guy. Yeah. You know, I always loved – remember the meat hook at Florida? Yep. Uh, I don't know what the hell happened to him. He went to the NBA for like 10 minutes. Um, loved the meat hook. Christian Okoye, Jerome Bettis, you know, the big heavy backs. Uh, always liked those guys. Uh, Cecil Fielder. Just loved this guy that would get up there and just rake. And yeah. he looked like me. You know, other than, you know, a couple of things. I uh, look just like me, you know. Big <laughs> fat guy out there just raking. And I'm like, that's, that's, that's my guy. I love the fat guys growing up. So I always loved Cecil. And then here comes little Prince looking just like him for crying out loud and doing the same thing and even being a better might, ball player. Might even be better. I don't know that there's a father-son combo that I like better than the fielders. Yeah, I mean, I, if I if – I... If I search hard enough, maybe I could find something that's comparable. Right off the top of my head, I can't think of one. And see how much you loved watching Cecil Fielder play? I hated it. Because, I mean, this was, when he played, I still lived in Chicago. You like damn fat guys? No, it, was, it absolutely wasn't because of that. It was because I still lived in Chicago at the time, and they were in, going up against the White Sox. And it seemed like every time he stepped up into the plate against the White Sox, he would hit it out of old Tiger Stadium, over the roof, like into another district. Like, it was just insane, and it just drove me nuts nuts love but now him. now i mean now that he's not playing anymore i can admit i love him and it bothers me that now prince fielder who i was a huge huge fan of now is going to be going up against the white Sox so still many works. times a year it's going to be bad i mean i'm still going to like him secretively but no more outwardly rooting for the guy closet prince fielder fan yep. you heard it here first <laughs> so not so much closet anymore so let me ask you this now i just told you i've always kind of rooted for the heavy guy you know um the, the meat hook. You can ask if I always root for the short guys? Yes. Yes, you, you absolutely. Ab absolutely. Absolutely always rooting for the short guys. That's Big what, Muggsy Bogues fan? Big Muggsy Bogues fan. Fun web? Earl Boykins. Uh -huh. uh, <laughs> I mean, yeah, I, I like them all. I'm a huge St. Louis fan. I've always been my favorite right since the second that he put on a lightning jersey. Always loved him. And I, I used to really like Scott Casimir, too, because he was a – little guy out there on the mound. He wasn't very big. I mean, I was a huge fan of him because of that, too. So, no, it's the same thing. You, li you like people that you could, uh, you could compare yourself with. I always liked Scott Casimir initially when I moved here because Scott Casimir was a uh, little guy and uh, was an ex-Met, and I grew up a Mets yeah. fan, so they traded him. And I'll never forget when that trade happened as a Mets fan at the time before I moved to Tampa. I'm like, what are you? What are you doing to me? And then I fell in love with this Rays team, as I've told you a million times when I started covering them, and I'm like, all right, Casimir's my guy. <sighs> until, until I had to interview him after a loss. And then, I, I hate to say it, I really, really, really like Scott Casimir. This isn't a he was a jerk like Delman Young thing. He was mentally soft. He was very mentally soft, and you could see it. And a great kid. Yeah. Great kid. Every time they lost and he was pitching, and that was just like I was talking about Matt Garza, and I love seeing that fire out of him after a loss. You could tell after Matt Garza lost, he couldn't wait to get back out there, and he had this fire inside of him. And Shields, not as much, but he wasn't mopey about it. Yeah. He was kind of pissy. You could tell he I cares. want you to be pissy. You could tell he cares. Yeah. I want you to be a little pissy after you just lost. You should be. I would be. Yeah. So I don't mind that out of Shields. Not quite the fire that I saw out of Garza, but it's still. Just different personalities. Yeah. Um, David Price. This is a guy 
he's like, you know, you know, everyone knows he's the goofball. He loves Twitter. He's all over the, you know, social media thing. He's a guy after a loss that you just see a focus in him. Again, not pissy, not fire, but he's got a focus. And when you hear him talk about things are going to be different next time, you can almost see the gears turning in his head because he's thinking about it. It was a very woe is me feeling from Scott Casimir after a loss. And again, I loved Casimir. I always believed he was uh, going to be great, like a lot of us did. Yeah. You know, I always thought uh, he was going to be part of this rotation for a long. I, I love Scott Casimir. But you could see it, and I never said it while he was here because I'm not going to throw a guy under the bus like that. But his career is over, and, you know, that's what we do. He was mentally soft, yeah. and you could see it, and uh, yeah, it bothered, bothered me a bit. I mean, no, and you could tell that it's he had all the physical talents he needed in the world just to, to succeed. He had all the gifts that he needed to be a successful starting pitcher in baseball, and you could tell that it's all between the ears oh, yeah. when the first thing that happens is you can't find the strike zone. And it was just a, it wasn't even a, like a steady decline. It was just a sharp decline from one year to the next when it came to pitches per at bat, walks per nine innings. They were just. God, remember third inning, he'd be up at 75 yeah, pitches. He'd yeah. Be going, what is going on? Like, all right, get Sonnenstein ready. Like, yeah. he, it, like it was a two headed. Like, every time that Scott Casimir got on the mound near the end of his run with the Rays, you knew it was going to be. He, was, he wasn't going the distance, and he might not even make it to the fifth just because it was so many pitches. Pitches per at bat. Every pitch he would—I don't know if he was just overanalyzing every pitch that he had, wanting it to be so perfect that he was just trying to hit a spot and he just would miss. And it was—it just kept snowballing on him to the point to where he'd be walking five, six guys through the first three innings, be over a hundred pitches in the fourth, and you could tell that that's all between the ears. I mean, you saw it happen with Rick Ankiel, and he had to completely revamp his career and go from being a starting pitcher to an to an outfielder because he just couldn't—he couldn't find the plate anymore. I don't know if you remember. That or not, but you remember that in the uh, in the playoffs against the Mets when the Mets went to the World Series against the Yankees when Rick Ankiel was just throwing at the backstop, That's couldn't awesome. even, couldn't even hit the catcher. I mean, and you could tell that was just all mental with him. And a lot of, you see a lot of the similarities between him and Casimir. But look at the huge difference. Ankiel did what he had to do to reinvent his career and become a, a good hitter and a good outfielder. I see you chuckling about uh, something. Uh, Roger Mooney, right here uh, from the Tribune. Ray's Howell reports today with more hair on his chin than on his head. <laughs> then in quotation, so I have to assume it, it came from Howell. You know it. Reverse the curse. <laughs> I, I don't know. I don't know what the curse is, but uh, we're going to take a quick break. We've got just a few minutes left. It's going to be a very quick break. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to come back. Chris and I are going to make pre-spring training predictions, and then we're going to do them again after the spring training, see uh, which was more accurate and who was more accurate at the end of the year. It's the Pat Donovan Show with Chris Kasak. We'll be right back right here on your home for live streaming sports in Tampa Bay. TLSTV.com. Escapes the tackler. Gets pushed out of bounds, but... Deep. And it's intercepted in the end zone by Robert Davis. And Nelson Aguilar will walk in again with another Berkeley prep touchdown.
escapes the tackler, gets pushed out of bounds, but... Deep. That is intercepted in the end zone by Robert Davis, and Nelson Aguilar will walk in again with another Berkeley Prep touchdown. Raise heavy, raise exclusive day yes. here on the Pat Donovan Show. We know Paul in Coventry, England is going to be thrilled to hear us talk nothing but Rays baseball for an hour. Paul, not a big football fan, but he'll listen when we talk Buccaneers, which is great. He did go to the Bucs yeah. game, of course, rocking a TLS shirt uh, in London, but uh, loves the Rays. This is a guy that you know, every time someone pisses and moans about driving over the bridge, they go, that's all right. Talk to my boy Paul out in Coventry, England, who uh, flies over the pond. He's coming again this summer. Nice. For uh, probably about a week. So, And uh, I plan on going at least one game while he's here, so maybe we'll go out together. Uh, good guy. And uh, we'll be thrilled to hear us talk and raise baseball. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to make a pre-spring training prediction. Then we're going to make a post-spring training prediction. And then at the end of the year, we're going to see who is most accurate and when. Obviously, I think post-spring training probably give us a better idea, but... I think even if the Rays go in and, and suck it up during spring training, uh, we're all still going to be pretty damn optimistic once the Bulls start to fly for real. Chris, you brought up a good point. When the Bulls do start to fly for real, pretty tough start to this year. Yes. Uh, I, I was just looking at the schedule. We open up here at home against the Yankees, or the, the Rays open up here at home against the Yankees, and then they go on the road for 10 straight after that. So 10 of, our first thir- 10 of the Rays' first 13 games – are going to be on the road. I like it. Huge test. I mean, and they and they got the cream of the crop of the of the AL when they got the Yankees, then Detroit, and then Boston in their first three series. It's going to be a big test, but we the Rays absolutely have the pitching to handle all of them. Yeah, I like it. I like it. Give them uh, uh, give them some tough stuff right off the top. You always say uh, you want to you know if you want to be a World Series contender, these are the guys you got to beat. Yep. You know, um, I like having to start tough. I think, it's a, I think it's a good thing. This is a team that historically has started a little bit slow, uh, but we've seen them a couple times come out on fire. Last year, you remember, was uh, abysmal yeah, really at the beginning poor of the start. season. I think because of that, there's an emphasis put on winning in spring training. I remember the year they went to the World Series, and Joe was talking about it in spring training. I want to put an emphasis on winning. I want to get these guys used to winning. And I think because of the way they started last year, there's an emphasis put on that again during this spring training. Don't be surprised uh, if you see them trying to win more than you, sometimes you do in spring training. You know, at the end of the day, spring training is like preseason football. Yeah. There is nothing less important than the final score. But I still think they put an emphasis on winning after the way they started last year. All right, we're going to do it real quick before we get out of here. Predictions. I'm going first. Yeah, of course. I'm the host. I, get, right. <laughs> I get to go last. How it works. Oh, right, yeah. You get to base your answer off of mine. No, All right. come on. You, you know damn well. You know damn well I've already got my number lined up. All right. Well, last year the Rays went 91-71. and 71, And I, I see an improvement from that this year for sure. And improving on 91 wins it's is tough. It, it's tough. But just getting out to a better start can erase a lot of those losses that they had from last year. And I think at least I'm, – I'm saying at least six games better. I'm going 98-64. and 98-64. I like it. Very similar. Um, and we'll, we'll put this up on my dry board in there. All right. I remember uh, sitting with my buddy Stefan over at 620. Uh, him and Greg Wolf, the promotions director over there, they had it at the beginning of the year. And it was funny because Stefan, a Red Sox fan – actually picked the Rays to have more wins uh, than, than Greg Wolf, our, our Rays fan. Wow. But uh, Stefan ended up being right, too. And uh, real close. I don't remember what the number was, but uh, kind of inspired my, my thing here. But I want to go preseason before spring training, after spring training, see how our thoughts differ. I'm going to go with a nice, clean, beautiful round number. I want to see it happen. I believe it can. The Rays, 
2012 Rays win 100 games. Wow. 100 games. That'd I be think great. They, and look, they probably don't. Yeah. Because they're in the best division in baseball, and they got to continue. You know, the Blue Jays are going to be a better team. The Orioles are going to suck. They're going to suck. I, I, I listened to one of their uh, announcers on with Dan Cilio a couple weeks ago, and he was like, we're going to suck. <laughs> he didn't say we're going to suck, but – he kind of said they're gonna, the Orioles are going to suck again. But the Blue Jays will be a better team. The Red Sox are always good. The Yankees are always good. And the Rays are damn. It's hard. It's going to be really hard for a team to win 100 games in this division. The Rays probably don't, but I'm going to say they do. All right, so with, with our wins and losses predictions, I'm, I'm saying they win the division. I'm guessing with 100 wins, I don't think you're expecting anybody else in that division to get 101 yeah, they or win 102. The East. I, I think that they win the East this year. Absolutely. I do. Wouldn't I mean, be the first time. I think, you know, we've heard it from other people. You've said it. I've said it. This is probably the best Rays team, and you can never predict injuries. Evan Longoria breaks his leg and misses the entire season. That's all out the window. Yeah. You can never predict injuries. I think most people think this is the best Rays team going into a season that they've ever had. I think they win 100. I'd love to see it. Lo- I, would lo- I would love to be wrong and for you to be right with our predictions. Yes. It's, it's so much fun. You know, I get a friend back home. And I ride him constantly because of all the dumb things he likes to say. And I'll never forget his wonderful day. He's in my bedroom. He called me. We're just sitting there on the phone. He goes, and this is when I was covering the Rays every day back at uh, one of the old radio stations. And I was there literally almost every home game, probably at least 75, you know. And um, (laughs) he calls me up, and and this is before the season, before the – 2008 season, by the way. Yeah. He goes, Pat, you probably have the coolest job of anybody I know. But does it suck having to cover a team you know will never make the playoffs? <laughs> and this is before the 08 season. And again, I'd be lying if I told you I thought they'd be in the World Series that year. But I said, uh-uh. Don't sleep on these guys, buddy. They get some great young pitching. They've got some great young players. This team's not there yet. They'll be in the playoffs within a few years. Who knew they'd be in the World yeah. Series that fall? But anyways, and this is the same guy told me that USF would never be any good probably months before they got up to number two. I mean, this guy is just the proverbial foot and mouth. Yeah. And uh, it, it always feels great to remind him how damn good the Rays are. And I'll tell you what, it always feels good as a Rays fan to see how damn good the Rays are. And you got to feel damn good about being a Rays fan heading into 2012 today. Pitchers and catchers reported – uh, Port Charlotte. I wish they'd come back to LA. Yeah. But they're at Port Charlotte. Better facility. It's a long ride. Uh, Steve Carney said if you're in St. Pete, I think he said I heard him on the radio this morning, 90-something minutes to get there. Not too bad. No. Head out there for a couple spring training games. We'll see you at the Trop come regular season. It's going to be a hell of a year for Rays fans. And uh, we'll talk about it each and every day right here on the Pat Donovan Show with Chris Kasak. That's all we have for you today. We'll talk to you tomorrow right here on Tampa Live Sports.